All right, well, good morning and welcome to Bideco Baptist Church. We're excited that you joined us this morning. Why don't you stand on your feet as we begin in song? Christ. 
you go ahead and be seated for just a moment. Hey, this morning we get to celebrate a baptism, uh, so it's a really exciting day. There's a lot happening today, uh, but we want to take a moment and celebrate this baptism as a church family. So you can go ahead and, and pay attention. Add to the excitement, we get to celebrate a baptism with Reba Babb. If you don't already know her, this is Reba. She's been in our church now since she was a very little girl, and just kind of to see her grow up and to grow in her faith has been exciting. Reba gave her life to Christ knowing that she was a sinner in need of a Savior, and she repented of her sins, and she gave her life to Christ. And now she's following through but with believers' baptism. Baptism is not something that saves us. It's nothing special about this water, but this does represent what Christ did for us in dying on the cross, going to the grave, and resurrecting from that grave. And that's what Reba is coming forward to do today, is to show us part of her testimony in following through with her faith through baptism. So that, Reba, what, who have you placed your faith in? God. God. Amen. Let me join me in praying for Reba. God, you are a great God. We do thank you for uh, the obedience of Reba. Uh, the, her new salvation that she had, that her right now as she continues to grow in her faith, that you'll use her uh, as a witness to her family, to her friends, to whoever she's around, to share the gospel and to represent you well. Thank you for this church and the support that we sh we show Reba, and I pray that you'll continue to help disciple her. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Reba, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son. Amen. All right, you can go ahead and stand back on your feet this morning as we continue in song.
my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all alone. Come on, church, we declare. This is the promise. So he shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, we give you honor, Jesus, because you're worthy, because you're worthy. Hey. Oh, we sing your praise. Come on, church, we declare this. Oh, praise. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. So we say, oh, praise the name of the we do give you honor in this place because you are so worthy because you are so holy thank you for stepping into this world stepping into our brokenness redeeming us paying a debt we couldn't pay and resurrecting from the grave something we could never do 
May we never lose the wonder of your presence, Jesus. It is your power, it is your Holy Spirit that transforms and changes and sanctifies communities and families. Whole households are changed because of your name. So Holy Spirit, may you continue to move in this place. May you continue to speak as your word is open. God, I pray that your word would go forth. We know that it doesn't return void. Lord, may our hearts be open and attentive and ready to hear. For every person in this room that you have a word for us today. So we give you all the honor and all the glory, Jesus. This is not about us. This is all about you. We love you, Jesus, but thank you for loving us first. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Well, uh, if you are, if you, maybe you came to observe the baptism and you have no idea what's about to happen. Uh, but for the past several months, we have been without a lead pastor, and we are excited that this morning, uh, Pastor John Gers and his family is here in view of a call. Uh, so again, if, if you're a guest with us this morning, there's going to be some business to take care of at the end as far as a vote goes, but, but enjoy this message as we as a church family enjoy it as well. Uh, so Pastor John, uh, come and, and share with us. All right, I tested the first service to see who my true Southern Baptist friends were. I'm going to do the same to y'all. God is good. And all the time. Okay, y'all did a little bit better than the first service. Don't tell them, but let's try it again because I think there's some, I think y'all can get a little louder. God is good. And all the time. Amen. The gospel prospers during the good times and the bad. More often during the bad. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 47. So I am excited to be with y'all this morning. Uh, my wife and I, we've been praying for literally a little over a year about the direction God would take us. God put it on my heart about potentially becoming a senior pastor. And so uh, that seems so long ago now and we're finally here. But I want to share with you a little bit about Acts before we dive in. So Acts ties the entire New Testament together. It ties the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament together. It picks up where the Gospels left off and picks up where the Pauline letters and the other apostles begin. Our goal today, how does Vitico Baptist Church keep moving forward? And so with that, let's go to Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 37. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. There's a few things we notice in this text. The first, the expectations of the gospel. And the second, the expectations for the church. As we look at our text, what are the expectations of the gospel? Now you have to understand, Peter has just finished preaching one of the greatest sermons ever preached in all of Scripture outside of what Jesus had preached. He is preaching to a predominantly Jewish audience. Now, 
There was probably some Jewish elite amongst the crowd, but this was probably a, a common, everyday Jewish audience. The message that Peter preached was Christ and Christ crucified. This message was so gripping, it was so gut-wrenching, that it caused a response. Dear friends, I want to tell you, when you hear the gospel preached, you will respond in one of two ways. The first way, probably the most common, is, I don't know about that Jesus. I don't know about that. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I don't feel like it's you know, for me. But the second is, my goodness, I'm in desperate need for a Savior. I need my sins forgiven. I need to know that I can be at peace with God. This Jewish audience that Peter was preaching to, they said, what must we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Now the same message was preached by Jesus, was preached by John the Baptist, was preached by Peter, was preached by Paul, was preached by James, that for in order for someone to be saved, it's simple. You repent and believe, or repent and be baptized. But let me tell you, church, you will not repent unless you believe. So then the question is, what must we believe? Or better, what must we confess? We must believe. First and foremost, that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. And at no point did he ever lose his divinity. Because if Jesus loses his divinity at any point in history, his, his work of atonement on the cross, which we just celebrated last week, is null and void. He ceases to be God if he gives up his divinity. At no point does Jesus do that. What he does give up is his heavenly throne. He humbly steps down and he comes to the cross in our place. We must believe that Jesus Christ was killed on a cross, was buried, and on the third day, hallelujah, rose again. We just celebrated it. And church, every single day, we should be celebrating Jesus risen for our sake. We must believe these things. And here's my favorite part now. I left this out in the first service, but I remembered it for the second. One day, Jesus is coming back. Now, I just want to give you some peace of mind about this. A lot of people will maybe have you believe that Jesus is up there in heaven, like, oh my, what are they doing? I, they've lost their mind. What are we going to do? What's the Scripture say? That He is seated at the right hand of God. And one day, church, He's going to get back up. And He's going to come for His own, for those that have put faith in Jesus Christ. Church, this is what we must confess we must believe these things now realistically i'd argue that there's about 10 things that we must believe but i think y'all want to go to lunch so we'll just stick with that so when you believe this what does it do it causes you to repent now genuine repentance genuine repentance knows that the evil of sin must be forsaken and the person and work of christ totally and singularly embrace. Repentance can only be possible when the Holy Spirit begins to draw us to Himself and we recognize the depths of our sin, we recognize the depths of our depravity, and we realize that it's only by Jesus. What is our hope in life and death? It is Christ alone. That is our hope. Repentance is only possible when we recognize the evils of sin, we recognize that we are being ripped away from the sovereign Lord of the universe. And then in short, that's the lengthy de definition. Here's the short. Repent means to turn. Well, to turn from what, preacher? You turn from the world's ways, from Satan's ways, from your own ways, and you turn to God's ways. God's ways will always be better. I promise you. But let me give you a little history about me. If you couldn't tell, I came out of the athletic world. Pretty hyper guy, pretty excited. But I will also tell you that when my team loses, I don't really care. Because at the end of the day, it's just a game. But that's probably from being in the athletic world for so long. But I wasn't always a believer. Now, I grew up in Alabama. And I'm no, neither an Alabama fan, and I'm not really an Auburn fan. I go for Auburn because that's, what my, that's who my wife pulls for. 
Happy wife, happy life. Unhappy wife gets stabbed with a knife, and it hurts. But my team's Liberty University. That's my team. And only me and Caleb Whitten got kind of beef with that because he went to Law Tech, and they're in the same conference. You're just mad because we beat y'all this year. Anyhow, I digress. But I wasn't always a believer. In fact, I didn't get saved until I was 21 years old. I was agnostic for a long period of time. I had a problem with how can Christians say that God is good while evil exists? But by the power of God. By His grace and His grace alone, He reveals to me in His Word who He truly is. He shows me that when you look at evil through the lens of the gospel, you realize that God is still a great and good God. And evil will not go unpunished. God is a just God. Isn't he? So I got saved at 21, and I thought at that time I was not going to be in the ministry. Because can I just confess to y'all, I didn't like people that much. Now, I love people now. My wife will tell you, she hates going to the airport with me because I will ignore her and I'll talk to everyone about Jesus. But it's funny how when you hear the gospel, how you respond and your life is dramatically and totally changed. This is what repentance looks like. And repentance, church, we must do it daily. We must preach the gospel to ourselves daily lest we slip and fall away. Peter also says, be baptized. We celebrated a baptism just now. That was you, right? I think, I don't know. Someone got baptized. Where, where'd she go? There she is. Okay. <laughs> and Caleb Miller said it. I think he looked at my sermon notes. But baptism in no shape, form, or fashion, does it bring salvation? Some people would have you believe that, but that's not what baptism is. Baptism is a profession of faith to the world around you. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords, and that's who I will live my life for. It is a profession among men, and it is also a step of obedience to looking more and more like Christ. Jesus was baptized. I should want to be baptized. Now here in Pontchartou, Louisiana, we got it pretty good. But you've got to understand, at the time that Peter was preaching this, to profess that Jesus is Lord, he gets your head cut off because of who was in charge at the time. Rome, if anyone professed that anybody was God or king outside of Caesar, they'd kill you. They'd just do away with you. And so we have some freedom. You can profess Jesus as Lord today. There's no threat. There's nothing really holding you back except maybe you. So we repent. We believe. We repent. We get baptized. Baptism is a significant, it should say ordinance, that's my fault. Baptism is a significant ordinance for Christians. And while it may not be a requirement for salvation, it serves as a meaningful symbol and evidence of one's faith. Believers follow the example of Jesus Christ in obedience and embrace baptism as an important part of their spiritual journey. It's important. So that's the expectations of the gospel. But what about the expectations of the church? Notice in Acts, when they heard this message, how they responded. They devoted themselves to Scripture. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching church. We must embrace this gospel as God's word and his final word. I love it when people come up and, and talk to me a little bit. You know, I just wish God would speak to me. And my response is, well, when was the last time you read the Bible? Okay, all right. Well, I mean like audibly speak to me. Okay, well, read your Bible out loud. I don't know what to tell you. Everything we need, church, for life and for godliness has already been written. We need no new revelation. We've got it. We've got the greatest revelation on earth. It's right here. You may have to turn it on or open it up. But this is all we need. A few years ago, actually it's probably 10 years ago, a long time ago, there was a commercial that came out and there was two women They were sitting at a cafe and one woman, you can see she had a, a, a Bible in her hand, and she's like, she's flipping through it, and she's, you know, she looks confused, perplexed. 
This other lady, she goes, you know, what's wrong? And she says, well, you know, I've read the Bible, but I just want more. And the lady goes, well, here's the Book of Mormon. No! <laughs> this is all we need. We don't need any other holy book, if you can even give it that title. The Bible is God's Word, and we submit ourselves to the Scripture and Scripture alone. If it says do this, we do that. If it says don't do this, we don't do that. But let's be honest, it's not about a list of do's and don'ts. It's about following God and His way. And the only way we're going to learn what His ways are, we have to read His Word. We have to study His Word. The second thing is they devoted themselves to the church. They devoted themselves to the assembly. Now this is something that I, I realize it may take some time, but I, I want us to change the mindset. And I used to be this way, okay? But let's not wake up on Sunday morning and go, all right, we got to go to church. Come on, kids. Stop fighting with your brother. Let's go. Well, I got two daughters. I get it. Parents, I get it. Trying to get them. That's why me and my wife drive separately now. I'm, I'm, I'm a person that I've got to be 15 minutes early and she's 20 minutes late. But let's change that from I have to go to church. No, no, no. We get to go to church. We get to come here and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We get to come here and hear the Word of God preached. We get to come here and we get to pray with one another. That's what the church is for. The church is for us, for the believers to come and to worship with one another. It's where we come together and we build each other up in prayer. You're going through a trial, go to the brothers and sisters in Christ and let them pray with you. you got something joyous going on in your life, go so we can rejoice with you. That's what the church is for. Let me tell you what the church is not. The church is not some fancy country club where only the social elite get to come and wear their Sunday best and act like they're better than everybody. That is not the church. The church is more like a mass unit on the battlefield. Where y'all, we've gone out there, we've tried to tell people about Jesus, we've taken a few hits ourselves, people have been mean, cruel, people aren't acting right, bosses aren't acting right, employees aren't acting right. Life is just confusing. That's why we get to come to church. We get to come here and do these things without any threat. They devoted themselves to Scripture. They devoted themselves to the assembly. And they devoted themselves to prayer. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you prayed? Let me, let me, let me change that. When was the last time you prayed and you meant it? And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you prayed for the nicest car, the nicest clothes, the best house. I'm not saying that. When was the last time you prayed, God, thank you for who you are. God, I, I, God, I'm a sinner and I've messed up. God, help me repent. And God, for my neighbor who is lost down the street, help me to be an effective witness for them so they too can come to know Christ. I think it was, now I didn't agree with everything this guy did, but I like a lot of what he did. But I think it was Martin Luther who said that he starts his day off every morning with something around six hours of praying, or four hours of praying. And if he's really busy, six hours of praying every morning. I can't pay attention for six seconds sometimes. Let's just be honest. One of my mentors, his name is uh, Pastor Lindsey Taylor. He's a preacher, or he was a pastor up in Canada. Don't hold that against him. Um, but uh, he runs... Strategic Renewal Canada. It's a, it's a mission ministry. I went to one of his conferences last year, and for 48 hours, all we did was pray. Y'all, it was the most refreshing thing. I'm telling you. Just to, just to be in a room full of pastors, and for 48 hours, all we did was pray. They had a worship band. They kind of played some stuff in the back. But all we did was pray for 48 hours. Prayer to the Christian is like oxygen. You neglect to pray, you suffocate yourself. I'm telling you, I believe in the power of prayer. I believe that God hears our prayers. And the early church, they, they had to devote themselves to prayer because of the persecution that they were coming under. To 
the expectations of the gospel, the expectations of the church, should you call me to be your pastor, how do I help this church move forward? Well, I've got three, three points. The first one, we have to love like Jesus tells us to. In Matthew 25, verse 34 through 40, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together, and one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Now in the Old Testament, there's 613 laws and commandments. You bored one day? Go read Leviticus. It'll take you two days to get through it. I'll challenge you. You want to be really, really thankful for Jesus? Read Leviticus 4. I promise you, you'll be like, oh, thank you, Jesus. It has to do with sin offering. But out of those 613 commandments, there's 10 of them that are most popular. And out of those 10 commandments, the first four, by design, are man's obligation to God, and the final six are man's obligation to man. When you look at what this, social, or what this religious elite said, he was testing Jesus. I want Jesus to say that the greatest commandment is to worship himself. That's what they wanted him to say. That's not what Jesus said. How did Jesus answer him? Jesus answered him with Scripture, and he says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see what Jesus did? He answers the entirety of the law by saying, you love the Lord God first and foremost. That's man's obligation to God, and then you love your neighbor as yourself. That's man's obligation to man. All right, well, who's my neighbor? I got him this time. Everyone's your neighbor. Everyone's your neighbor. We're to love people the way that Jesus commands us to love. That does not mean that we, sim we simply just accept anything and everything that they're doing. That doesn't mean that. But we love them so much that we're going to tell them the truth of the gospel. We're going to tell them who Jesus is. We're going to tell them that Jesus loves them. And if I could just be so bold as to say this, Lost people are going to act like lost people. We just need to quit being shocked by that. Let's go out there with the gospel message of Jesus Christ and tell them that Jesus loves them and they can turn to him with their sin and repent and be baptized and be one of God's children. So that's the first thing. The second thing, we are to learn from his word. We are to never stop learning from God's word. This is all we need for life and godliness. In Matthew eleven twenty five 25 through 30, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure. All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal Him. I love this. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden this is the God we serve. We learn from Him. We learn from His Word and His Word alone. And I'm going to challenge you. Even though I'm not done with the message, but I'm going to go ahead and challenge you. And I say this in love. If all you're doing is come to church one hour on a Sunday, it's not enough. If, if all you're doing is getting your Jesus for one hour every Sunday, it's not enough. Statistically speaking, if that's it, you come to church. We come to church, what, 52 hours on average every year, give or take? Somewhere in there, that's a fair number. And if the only time that we ever open our Bibles is when the preacher gets up to preach, 
Well, normally a pastor preaches for about 30 minutes, all right? So that number gets cut down for like proper biblical teaching to like maybe 26 hours. It starts getting cut. If all you're doing is coming to church one hour a week on a Sunday and that's the only Jesus you get out of all the week, church, it's just not enough. We should desire to have Jesus every single day because we need Him every single day. We never stop learning from His Word. The third thing, we are to lead others to Christ. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Church, we have nothing to fear. Let's go out into this community and tell people about Jesus. Before I came, I was able to read the, the demographic report of church affiliation. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but there are more people just within the five-mile radius of Betaco Baptist Church that will claim they have no church affiliation. Within 10 miles, the number gets bigger. Within 15 miles, it gets even larger. Now, I love that this church, they, they go to Kentucky, they go to Texas, they go to Boston. I love, keep doing that. We're going to keep doing those mission trips. But y'all, the mission starts right here, too. It's got to. It starts in your own neighborhoods. It starts in your own homes. It starts right here. We've got to get out there. We've got to tell people about Jesus. We can't save them, but we can point them to the King of Kings that can. Church. We must lead others to Christ. I want to conclude with this. You'll hear this a lot, should I be your pastor. What is a mature disciple? A mature disciple is someone who is continually growing in their walk with Christ. They hunger and thirst for the things of God, and they exhibit the fruit of the Spirit consistently. They are not sinless, but they sin less. Are you walking daily with Jesus? When people look at you based off the evidence that they see, can they say, yeah, they're a Christian. They're on fire for the Lord. Or, I don't know, I can't tell. They go to church, but I don't really know. What you do with Jesus matters. And for everything we can possibly understand, you do have a choice today. Should I be your pastor? Should I not be? I will at least rest easy tonight knowing that you had the opportunity to hear the gospel. And what you do with that matters. Now, you can choose to ignore this message. You can choose... To, to not have Jesus pay for your sin. You, you have that right. You can choose that. You can choose to pay for your sin yourself. But know what you're asking. Know, know what you're telling God. God, I'd rather spend an eternity separated from you paying for my own sin. Or the better choice, Jesus Anyone who comes, confesses their sin, repents, is walking, doing the best they can, is truly a child of God. We're not going to get it right 100% of the time. But when Jesus is with us, He'll convict us, He'll change us, He'll help us. Because what is the last part of that or that scripture said in Matthew? I'm with you. To the ends of the age, I'm with you. So in just a moment, Brother Caleb's going to come and we're going to close. I would love the opportunity to pray with somebody about putting faith in Jesus Christ today. Maybe you just need prayers. Maybe life's not going great. And you just need someone to pray with you. I'd be glad to pray with you. Maybe, maybe you want to rejoice. Maybe something's going good. And you just want to rejoice. I'll rejoice with you. But as long as I've been in ministry, I've learned sometimes people just need a shoulder to cry on. I can always get a new jacket. It's fine. But 
We're going to pray. The altar will be open. And then we'll go from there. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Gracious God, Sovereign Lord of the universe, You are holy, You are good, You are righteous in all You do. God, I pray that You will convict us. Change us. Make us more like Your Son. Help us to repent of our sins and to grow closer to You. We love You, Lord. You are our only hope in this life and in death. May we rejoice in these truths. In Your name that we pray. Amen. Please stand. Go ahead and be seated. 